Hello everyone, Matt Ricker here, North Carolina State University. Today we're going to talk about the coastal plain. So we've been talking exclusively about the Piedmont, which are rolling hills. This is the coastal plain, Piedmont transition we call the fall zone here in North Carolina. So we're in Clayton, North Carolina, one of the suburbs of Raleigh. If this class was still going on, we'd probably have come out here and looked at what we call coastal plain marine sediments. So you can see this soil that we've dug out here uh, has some distinguishing characteristics that make it significantly different than the soils of the Piedmont. So the soils of the Piedmont are residual, colluvial, or alluvial soils, and they form through geologic weathering into hard rock. So mostly granitic rocks or, or metamorphic rocks. Here, our apparent materials are actually sediments that were draped by ancient seas. So ancient seas have uh, come up into this zone and laid down what we call unconsolidated marine sediments, and that's the parent material here. And these parent materials tend to be significantly sandier in overall composition compared to our Piedmont textures, and as well as, you notice here, the color is a lot more yellow relative to the Piedmont where we have our much redder soils. Here, uh, we're lower in iron, we're also at a landscape position where we have water, and so we have a yellower soil. Uh, the big thing you can see here is uh, we do have an AP, we're in the woods, but there's an AP here, so this has been plowed, and that extends to about 20 centimeters, but the really noticeable thing here is this really light E horizon. So this is a really nice example of an eluvial horizon and notice it's very thick so it extends down to 60 centimeters. The overall composition of this material is predominantly sandy. So these are loamy sands. So I can make a cast or a ball. I can toss it lightly but it starts falling apart and I cannot ribbon the material. So sand wouldn't even make a ball. Sand would just fall apart on its own. And you can also see there's like some staining the vines on my fingers. Uh, this is loamy sand. So the surface is loamy sand and the E horizon is loamy sand. This is a, a special characteristic that we call arenic morphology, which means you have between 50 and 100 centimeters of loamy sands or sands or sandy textures at the surface. This is important for interpretations because the sand cap imparts a lot of challenges, right? So it's fairly droughty, it doesn't hold a lot of water. The water transmits very quickly into this soil. And then down here are our BT horizons. So just like in the Piedmont, we have predominantly our E horizons are related to clay forming and clay moving. And so you go from maybe three to 5% clay in the AP and the E here. And we have good subangular blocky structure. But very quickly you go to, this is sandy clay loam. As you go down, you get more and more clay in a soil like this. So the clay has formed and moved over long periods of time. The oldest soils in all of North Carolina tend to be on this landscape position, uh, sort of what we call an interfluve in between two river systems. These soils can be upwards of 5 million years old. And over 5 million years, you formed a lot of clay and moved it. So the clay just keeps increasing. So you go from a sandy clay loam to a sandy clay here. And we're pushing 40% clay in the bottom. And the other thing you can see in the bottom of this soil, and I'm standing in water right now, about to go waist deep, is redoxomorphic features. So you see your concentrations of iron and you see these gray zones of depletion. Indicating, obviously, we have a seasonal high water table. And if you don't believe me, uh, you know, there's waist high water in the bottom of this pit right now. If you look closely, you can see that the iron oxidation or the iron concentrations are in predominant bands, sometimes called tiger striping around here. This is very common before forming something we call plinthite, which is it's basically a zone where the water table goes up and down continuously in that zone. And because of that fluctuating water table, you oxidize iron and over 
geologic time, that iron becomes semi-cemented, we call plinthite. So if you get plinthite in the soil around here, you'll call it a BT with a little V, little V indicating plinthite. Uh, plinthite is a precursor to pedogenic ironstone, which is a petroferric contact. It's a, it's a root limiting layer that becomes cemented with iron. This is not quite there yet, uh, but it's got the morphology that eventually Given enough time, you could form something like plinthite on a on a landscape like this. And there is plinthite mapped in the adjacent woods around here. We just don't have a pit to show plinthite, but it's really red iron oxides that are kind of crunchy. And the big thing there is if you dry it out, it becomes irreversibly hardened. So there's a lot of land use interpretations associated with plinthite in the coastal plain of North Carolina. Another important interpretation for this soil, talking about redox concentrations, but more specifically the depletions. When you have over 2% depletions or gray zones, that's your seasonal high water table. So in this soil, we have an AP, we have an E, we have a BT1, and we have a BT2. And the second BT is where the common concentrations come, or the common concentrations and depletions come in. And that is approximately here which is around 80, 80 centimeters. And so this soil would, would not classify as a well-drained soil, it would classify as moderately well-drained. And this has impacts on the interpretations, especially engineering, if you're gonna put a house with a basement or something of that nature. And then also it depends on the crop. You kinda of wanna match a crop that can deal with the sand on the top and the water table coming up within 100 centimeters of the soil surface. So well-drained soils typically will have the depletions will start below a meter. All right, let's talk about landscape position here in Clayton, North Carolina. The pit we were just in is over my right shoulder. And if you look out, we have farm fields. And broadly, we're on this really slow sloping, you know, back slope. And then we're going to take a little trip down our Katina sequence, just like we did in the Piedmont, but we're going from our back slope summit type position. The next pit, which is over here, is gonna be on the shoulder position. We'll have another pit further down on the lower back slope. And then we're gonna auger way at the bottom of the hill over here and look at changes again in our, in our predictable parent materials, or in some cases, not as predictable as you might think. All right, we moved down the hill a little bit <clears throat> since that last soil pit. We're on the true shoulder position now, the most erosional part of the landscape. This soil is a variation or a variant of the first soil. The soil series here is Banu. Uh, Banu soil series is an arenic paleudalt, which basically is telling us in classification that we have over 50 centimeters of loamy sands or sands on the surface, which in, impacts the interpretations. Uh, Udalt, Udic moisture regime, we get a lot of rain, uh, alt being ultisol and then pele being old. So this is an old stable ultisol that has continuous or increasing clay with depth. Very similar to the first one, we have a nice thick AP we have an E, again extending uh, down to almost 60 centimeters of our sands and loamy sands, going into BT1, BT2. And again, we're up around 40% clay as we get towards the bottom. This is a variation or a variant of the first pit. And here we don't have that uh, sort of horizontal tiger striping, but what we do have is these extreme areas of accumulation of iron where you see this really red material this again is a precursor to plinthite this really red color uh this get down to this second bt check out the depletions so we got really nice examples of depletions in the matrix Oop, falling apart but they're gray colors so you have concentrations and depletions your seasonal high water table here is about 90 centimeters. So we're gonna take a walk down the hill a little bit more to the lower back slope and see what we got. All right, so we've moved down the landscape. So we went general back slope, shoulder. Now we're on the lower 
back slope heading into the foot slope and a floodplain down below us. The interesting thing about the fall zone of North Carolina is it's a transition. It's a transition zone where the ocean came up over the Piedmont and laid sediments down and then it retreated over time. And it did this multiple times, transgression, regression sequences, forward and back the ocean came over this area and deposited our unconsolidated marine sediments. But in the fall zone, the sediments that are draped on top of the Piedmont are relatively thin. As you move out towards the ocean, they get thicker and thicker. All that sediment is actually the erosion of the Appalachian Mountains. And so you can get a thousand feet of unconsolidated material as you get out towards the Outer Banks in North Carolina. In this area where the fall zone, it's, it's, a, it's a zone where the Piedmont is ending and the coastal plain is beginning, but the two are intermixed. And so we're only probably 30 feet in elevation lower than we were when we started on this transect. And what has happened is this stream system below us that we'll take a look at in a minute has moved back and forth and eroded a lot of that uh, unconsolidated material from this site and moved it downstream and exposed at the bottom the underlying Piedmont soils. So quite literally this soil pit has coastal plain, the first two horizons are coastal plain sediments, over our Piedmont residual sediments. So we have a lithologic discontinuity. We have coastal plain literally draped on top of the Piedmont rock underneath. As you move out towards the ocean, even 30 miles from here, if you move 30 miles to the east, this Unconsolidated material will be 300, 500 feet thick. You'll never see the underlying Piedmont rocks. So you'll never see this in any zone except for here, right near Raleigh, where it's the very edge of the coastal plain in Piedmont. And so, so because of that, the ocean didn't put a lot of um, material on top. You can actually see both parent materials here. And that's what the fall zone is sort of famous for geologically. So here we have an, an A horizon. It's fairly thin, only 20 centimeters. It's probably been plowed here. Uh, so I call it an AP, but you can see in the upper material, extremely rounded course fragments. And we'll go down the, the hill in a minute and you'll look at this first order stream. There's no way that the stream that's here currently moved materials this large and rounded them. The amount of distance and energy to round course fragment this round, this big, uh, it's pretty extensive and so what would have been happening here is the ocean would the uh, ocean edge would have been in this area and there would have been large river systems sort of braided river systems dropping sediment as they enter uh, the oceanic system and so this is like braided fluvial probably fluvial marine deposits so well-rounded gravelly material in here little river jacks everywhere we have our ap down to 20 now we have another e horizon down to about 40 and then immediately you jump in clay into the beat into the two bts so this is a second paramaterial this is coming from residual looks very similar to what we've seen in the piedmont because it is this is the piedmont with coastal plain on top of it and then you see you get really red at the at the base of the soil but the other thing you might notice is there's if you look in certain areas there's remnant rock structure here. So you can sort of see these veins of more felsic material, these white veins of felsic material. That's a, it's a, it's the fabric of the original rock that was here before uh, weathering occurred. So this is telling us that this is likely residual material with transported fluvial marine on top. And the big thing here is we put a two or a two BT and then here because we have the remnant rock structure and you notice the pedogenic structure the shapes is going away I would just call this a two BT and then this is a two BCT so it's like a B horizon but it's got rock structure not very good uh, um, pedogenic structure and it's transitioning from the BT to the C which would be saprolite which would be below this so this is a very interesting soil. Other things you could see here uh, up in the BT, we have charcoal and this charcoal is in a dendritic pattern. 
this is a coarse root channel. So when the original settlers would have come, they would have slashed and burned the landscape to get some agricultural productivity. And when they burned the stumps, the fire would have went down the coarse root channels and created charcoal. And this what is we're going to do is go a little further down to the foot slope position and the floodplain or the toe slope and see how our soil characteristics change even further. Now we're at the lowest part of the landscape here. So we transition from our nice cap of coastal plain, unconsolidated marine sediments or sandy soils on the surface. With our BT horizons underneath, we transitioned into a zone where we could see the Piedmont underneath. That's what makes this area so unique. And then we move down below that into our alluvial soil bottomland. So we saw the video about alluvial soils and the buried horizons and all these other things that we key in on if we think we have alluvium. In the coastal plain, it's much more rare to get buried horizons, uh, really evident stratification, especially along small streams like we're along at the bottom of this hill. And this is the soil that is uh, characteristic of the coastal plain. And this is the Bib Soil Series. So the Big Soil Series is, is essentially A horizons over C horizons. And when you have A horizons over C horizons, you get an entosol. So this is a really, really weakly developed soil. It's very sandy. You hear the sand, you hear that grit. So this is a sandy loam or sandy clay loam typically. You can see rounded coarse fragments. And for this particular soil that we dug out, we have a uh, pretty thick A horizon from zero to almost 30 centimeters. Then we have a zone that's sort of a transition, I'd call like an AC. And then here we have a C horizon, but notice the color is very gray, right? And then we have the orange color. So as I said, um, wet soils tend to have yellow, orangish colors. There's a specific mineral called lepidocrosite that really likes wet sites. It's kind of a pumpkin orange color. Uh, if you see yellow or orange colors, especially low on the landscape, it's typically because of wetness. Uh, but what you can see here is sandy. It's structuralist massive. It's it looks kind of like it may be subangular blocky, but it just comes out as a big block from the auger, uh, which we'll call structuralist massive structure. And this is what we call hydric soil or wetland soil. And what this is, is you have your A horizon, your humus is over thickened. The reason being it's really wet. So the microbes have problems breaking down the organic matter that's added. And wetland soils tend to have thick A horizons, not because of plowing, but because of accumulation of organics, because the wetness impedes their ability to break it down. And then right underneath the humus rich layer, the, there's no transition. It goes from uh, this AC to a CG. And if that CG is directly below the dark surface or the, the humus surface, we'll call this a wetland or hydric soil. The saying is black and gray stay away. So if you see this morphology, there's it's a really wet site. We got water standing on the surface. We got all kinds of swamp tupelo trees, red maple, a lot of indicators of really wet hydrology. A site like this is, is gonna come out severe for most interpretations because of water table. The seasonal high water table in a site like this is to the surface or above in the spring every year. Uh, this is a seasonally flooded site. So you're gonna have six, eight inches of water over the surface uh, once the spring rolls around. So that is our catena sequence here. It's a little odd. We have marine sediments, marine sediments, marine over um, Piedmont, and then we have alluvium at the bottom. So not all catenas are perfect, but again, illustrating changes in wetness, changes in parent materials, changes in interpretations across the landscape focusing here on the coastal plain.